we're here today to talk to you about uh, uh, radio waves, mm -hmm. which are That's the right. final uh, installation in our series of talks about the whole electromagnetic spectrum, uh, right. of which most of the light is invisible. Uh, right. And uh, often we wouldn't even think of radio waves as, mm -hmm. we, we, as, as visible or invisible light, really. Yeah, we just think of it as that's true. sound, but, but it's not sound. Of we course, think of it? radio as sound, but actually mm. radio waves are invisible light, just like gamma rays or infrared or any of these other types of light that we've talked about this week. Um, there, I mean, mm -hmm. Radio waves are used for communications, for radar, for navigation, for Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And they're used in astronomy as well, but we've done a lot of astronomy, so we're not going to look at astronomy exactly. today. Exactly. Uh -huh. um, they're electromagnetic radiation with very long wavelength, the longest wavelength. Really that long always. I mean, it can mm. go from one millimeter. But one millimeter to, is a microwave. That's radiation. a microwave, yeah. but it's mm. still considered a radio wave. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. One millimeter right up to 10,000 kilometers. And apparently it can even go beyond that. It can go up to uh, 100,000 kilometers. Ultra long, mm. ultra long waves. Mm. Yes, mm. indeed. <laughs> But, but we don't produce those because the antenna would be impossibly long to That's possibly right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, radio waves are me measured in hertz, and I always had a problem actually figuring out what hertz were for, for a long, long mm. time, um, until I looked at this diagram and I realized uh, it's to do with frequency. So, so it's a measure of frequency, how many times the thing is going up and down. That's what hertz designates. So a 300 gigahertz wavelength, that's like 300 thousand hertz means it's going up 300,000 times a second really really fast mm -hmm. like that so obviously it's got to be really small mm -hmm. as opposed to a 30 hertz wavelength is only doing like 30 uh, uh, oscillations a second so it's going quite slowly not mm -hmm. as slowly as me but so but, it's um, the opposite of you know when you say one millimeter you're talking about 300 gigahertz and yeah, when you're talking really about fast uh, you're talking about 10,000 kilometers, you're talking about 30 hertz. Yeah, so really long and mm. slow. And if you were talking about 100,000 kilometers, you'd be talking about 3 hertz, wouldn't you? That's it, mm. exactly, mm. but yeah. it's just far too long. Um, a radio wave, we're often used to, the, the, the image we were just looking at was a sine wave. Uh, it's not really, it's just a kind of a diagram uh, mm -hmm. that helps us to understand frequency and amplitude. Uh -huh. Because and waves actually are in three dimensions, mm. Mm. But, but generally we have to represent them in some type of mm. graphic way we can understand, so two or th two dimensions really. And this, this would probably give you a more accurate uh, representation mm. of what happens with a radio broadcast. Uh, so they're uh, spreading out in a lot of mm. different directions. They're very, in a very mm. complicated way, but this is still of course a two-dimensional uh, uh, representation of, of, uh -huh. of something that's happening in three dimensions. Uh -huh. so, so you get the idea of the complexity of the forms of these. And uh, uh, yeah. if we look at the history, uh, uh, we talked before uh, in the very f in the in the second talk uh, mm -hmm. we introduced when we introduced the electromagnetic spectrum. We said that the reason we call it the electromagnetic spectrum is that it all flows out of the work of Maxwell, the the, the mm -hmm. Scottish uh, professor James of Clark physics. James Clark Maxwell. James James Clark Maxwell, mm -hmm. who was a Scottish professor of physics at uh, Cambridge in the late 19th century. That's and, right. And he made the, like, the connection between uh, electromagnet well, electricity, magnetism and light mm. and showed that they're all part of the same phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Which is the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, now another scientist, who, who, a German scientist, who was very interested in Maxwell's theories, uh, and he wasn't the only one, uh, was Hertz. Yeah, Heinrich yeah. Rudolf Hertz. Mm. He was at, um, a lecturer in physics at Karlsruhe University mm. and uh, one day he was demonstrating to some students um, uh, induction using a thing called Rice's spirals. Now what these mm. are, are they're like uh, coils of wire essentially, mm. two coils of wire, wire and you put them together and uh, close to each other. So the, so the Rice's coils induce a, um, a, a current and sparks go between the plot. The, 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 the plugs essentially, the ends of them. And so he thought, what if I did this in a much bigger way? And so we set up this amazing uh, experiment with these giant zinc balls, mm. which are, he was using as capacitors. So they were going to like have a capacity to hold electricity in them. And then he's got a wire, if you can see it here, mm -hmm. and, and these 
two little other balls at a, at a distance. And Which are smaller. They're smaller. And they're very close together. Yeah, well, they're yeah. a couple of millimeters yeah. apart, mm -hmm. right? So there's, there's an electric copper, a copper wire and an electric current is set up in the copper wire. Mm -hmm. He applies a current across it, if I understand correctly, and sparks jump across mm. between those two other little little balls in the middle there. So it shows that there's an electric current okay. there. Now what happened is he set up this other, another coil. We can see it in the foreground here, mm -hmm. um, uh, with also with a spark gap. Mm -hmm. And suddenly sparks started to flow across that as well, or jump mm -hmm. across it. So he proved that this... This would have been uh, Maxwell's theories of... Yeah. electromagnetism in, in, in action. But exactly. of course it was also wireless. Uh, it was it, wireless it was, communication. Yeah, well, yeah. what he, did, he showed is that the electromagnetic, there was an electromagnetic field set up and that was setting up another current mm. in, a, in another uh, coil, mm. but it was communicating. So therefore we had wireless energy passing from one yeah. coil to the other. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that was really what he did. But he, he wasn't really that concerned with communications at all. And in fact, he said, he, he after said in eighteen eighty seven, I do not not think that the wireless waves I've discovered will have any practical application. My God, that was in eighteen eighty seven. Yeah. Like uh, radio, uh, radio communication was invented what seven years later. Absolutely, yeah. and Marconi. Yeah, Marconi. Uh, yeah, yeah was, we're going to come to that. Painting it. And, yeah. yeah, but look, uh, we already out. before we even go mm. on to Marconi, um, look at the beauty of this uh, experiment. Uh, yeah. And this is something we're uh, that we're going to mm. look at now in this talk quite a lot. Is is what beautiful forms, uh, these, these beautiful, beautiful platonic forms. Absolutely, yeah. beautiful yeah. things, these, these spheres. So, and it's quite extraordinarily associated with its time, but uh, but they're, mm. time, they're also timeless in a way. Um, mm. And then, now we go on to talk about a person who came from a very different culture because he wasn't an academic at all, uh, Marconi. Exactly. Guglielmo. So, big Guglielmo. 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 I looked it up this morning. <laughs> Guglielmo. Guillermo Marconi, <laughs> Marconi, very good, very good. Um, <laughs> you've oh, done your research. <laughs> an Italian aristocrat, uh -huh. um, his dad, Giuseppe Marconi, married an Irish woman. Oh yes, a, a one of the Jemisons, wasn't he? Um, Annie yeah. Jemison, oh, that's okay, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And um, Guillermo May was brought up, um, uh, he was quite protected as, as he was. He didn't actually go to school or, or university. He had private tutors at home. Okay. Either in... Made quite a beautiful home too. I they lived yeah. oh, in yeah, a magnificent... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, almost palatial residency yeah. close to Venice wow. um, so either there or else some other residencies I think in London in the London area mm -hmm. um, so um, he was incredibly interested in, in electronics and in radio mm -hmm. well, in, in all of this you know electromagnetic spectrum and so um, his mom who was a very dynamic woman organized that he would he would have tutoring in this area but then he would also um, become the assistant to um, the, a professor in, in physics at Bologna University mm -hmm. so we learned a lot that way and uh, he started trying out stuff at home basically building mm -hmm. with the help of his butler uh, building um, these electromagnetic devices at home. Mm. So the, be, uh, once again a beautiful a beautiful thing and especially from the eye of a contemporary artist uh, uh, in the in the early twenty first century, you look at this and you think, "Wow!" So this time. is 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 um, more or less an installation for sending uh, a telegraph, you mm -hmm. know. So so which would have been wired communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. But so but he modified he it to add this plate, uh, this aluminium plate, is it? That's right. That yeah, that's yeah. that's um, a, an antenna. So yeah. what you have is is a spark conduct a spark. What are spark plugs here generating electricity mm. on the left? Um, so that would be similar to what we saw. Uh, in Hertz's experiment. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's generating ge generating electricity, and then that that's passing electricity to the, to an induction coil, and then it's powered by a battery actually. Mm. Um, so it's generating a yeah. signal, yeah. and then onto this this uh, more or less more, wireless Morse code, Morse code yeah, yeah. Uh, a little yeah. device here on the right. right. And the thing that I think the important thing about this this is a standard Morse code. Um, set up. Set up. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the important thing is that he added he added this um, monopole antenna. Okay, yeah. so yeah. it's like this big square piece of metal here. Right. That's an antenna, and that allowed him to send a signal uh, three and a half miles. Like five kilometers. That's yeah. like halfway across town. Yeah. 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 Which was yeah. pretty good for the time. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, at the same time, this is 1894, mm. and you know everything goes very fast mm. from there. Yeah. So he first of all he tried to contact the Italian Minister of Post mm. and Telegraph, and he was 
they just threw his letter in the bin, didn't they? Well, I don't know if they yeah. threw it in the bin, but they kept wrote, they didn't read it and they wrote, or well, at least they didn't act on it and wrote um, Alla Lungara, which is mm. Via della Lungara. Which is the lunatic asylum. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh-huh. yeah. Yeah. So, so that was. Um, so he left Italy, <laughs> uh, went to uh, London. Yeah, uh, with his mum. I mean, uh, so. Annie um, Jemson was mm-hmm. uh, very, you know, determined to support her son. So she brought him to London, and she arranged a meeting with the chief electrical engineer of the British Post Office. Mm-hmm. And uh, so from there, rest is history. Britain really, was a maritime empire, yeah. Uh, yeah. A, a global maritime empire. Uh, mm. So uh, their interest was communication with their empire, and, and especially communication with their ships, with ships ship yeah. to shore. Because mm. it, I mean. They, they, they could communicate across land, they, had, they even had cables going under the mm-hmm. sea, across the Atlantic, across the Channel, um, uh, uh, right across Asia, uh, uh-huh. but they couldn't communicate with ships, and that's, that's, a, that's a bit of a disadvantage for a maritime empire. Absolutely. So the yeah. British, uh, they saw the value of this immediately, mm. and they suggested he should patent it, mm-hmm. and um, fair, good, good on them, actually, they didn't mm-hmm. steal it. Yeah. And so on the yeah. 2nd of June, 1896, he patented it uh, with the title Improvements in Transmitting Electrical Impulses and Signals and in Apparatus Therefore. Okay, and, <laughs> and here we're looking at, this is already a year later in 1897. Okay, uh, and this is the post office engineers. Engineers of the British post office are mm. working with equipment uh-huh. uh, from the Marconi company. Uh, and uh, Amazing, uh, once again, beautiful apparatus. Beautiful, beautiful apparatus. Um, um, the first successful transmission across the English Channel was from Wimero in France to South Foreland Lighthouse in England, and that was in 1899. 1899. Yeah, and yeah. it was um, from, let's see, the St. Paul, which was mm-hmm. an American passenger liner. Mm. It sent a Morse code message to an English radio receiver 66 miles away from the British coast. Okay. So coast about 90, mi- 90 kilometers. Yeah. 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 So uh, so it was it moved very very mm. fast and look how sophisticated the, the equipment is already. I suppose a lot of it would have been ba- would have been based on uh, telegraph equipment mm. uh, that would have been mm. uh, not wireless but yeah, wired yeah, yeah. communication. But look look at the heroic scale of what they were yeah. doing. Yeah. Well, the big interest then was transatlantic communications. Mm. You know, they'd figured out how to do it. You know, within Europe and across the sea, close mm-hmm. by. Mm-hmm. But how to get across across the Atlantic? And so, um, so um, Marconi got funding to build a station in a place called Poldhu in Cornwall. Mm. And the idea was that they would try have a really big station there and with a really really big transmitter and mm. try to send signal right across the Atlantic. Okay. And I think they were they were relatively ex- successful with mm. that. They so got to the, Newfoundland. The, the Newfoundland was, it, yeah. was 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 the first uh, station mm. of call. And yeah. l- look at the scale of this project. Uh, this is a, an antenna. So the drawing shows an antenna based yeah, on a cube. Yeah. Uh, that was probably the original like design. An, like an inverted pyramid within mm, a cube mm. and then and then I, I don't know that these are just two variations of the one variation that got built but the the the, the, the photograph is of a cylinder uh, and these yeah are the, these a little bit like a gas silo mm, or something mm. like that and you look at the scale mm. of the buildings you get some idea of the yeah. of the, of the enormous yeah, monumentality yeah. of these of these projects so so it was all about transatlantic communication that's yeah. right that's right but the thing is with Paul Du, um, is they got a, f- a grant from from um, the Canadian government of eighty thousand mm. um, dollars uh, to build a station in Nova Scotia, mm-hmm. and uh, it which didn't, was a little yeah. bit further yeah. uh, west That's than right. Newfoundland. That's right. And they couldn't yeah. pick up a signal yeah. from Paul Du mm. at all, so mm. so they had to move a bit further west. Mm-hmm. So they chose a site in the west of Ireland. Clifton, yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, look at the, the size of this installation mm. that they're building. So, you know, I mean, these things, this is the, the, so, the condensing so you, house. Is that the, yeah. this is the, um, so the condenser house? And it's just... From what we understood, uh, they, they, were, they were creating enormous voltage and sending them through along these mast fields uh, to send uh, very, very long waves mm. across the Atlantic. So, so when they built this in, in um, the Marconi station in, in Clifton, which mm. is... Uh, in the west of Ireland, um, they had they built this huge condenser house and then a powerhouse with six boilers, mm, um, which worked off turf. Uh, that that's right. Yeah, there. so it yeah. was very convenient actually. Yeah. Yeah. And then eight masts, and the masts were two hundred and ten feet high each. 
Hmm. So these were massive, and they were sending these like crackling signals. Apparently, you could hear the crackle hmm. for miles around. Hmm. So uh, it were extraordinary uh, feats of engineering, uh, these, uh, and you know, it just it gives you some idea of the vigor uh, uh, that there was in industrial culture. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, uh, and like, I mean, the century. energy, you know, just get it done. I mean, it mm. was, what, less than less than 10 years ago, he mm. was a kid and, and you yeah. know, he was going along with his mom to see these people and try mm -hmm. and sell them this idea. And here we are 10 years, 10 later, years later and, yeah, you know, yeah. sending signals right across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Yeah, setting up bases in Newfoundland mm. and, uh, and in the west of Ireland. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he didn't do, I mean, he didn't do the first audio broadcast, Marconi. Good evening. All of this was Morse code signals, wasn't it? Mm. So they were, you know, they weren't transmitting music or. So around about the turn of the century, it was just Morse code, uh, which 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 telegraph uh, uh, communication had, had always been in the mm. 19th century, um, uh, and then in 19, 1906, um, Reginald Fessenden uh, created the first uh, audio transmission. Okay, uh, audio, okay, audio and this is. Uh this image really is really this image is really interesting because that's the rice spiral. See, oh, yeah. in the foreground okay. there. Okay, I wonder how that works. That, uh, well, they're the two coils you can yeah. see. Yeah. I don't okay. know why he's using them, but mm. um. Yeah, um, you see, you see the same the same forms coming again and mm. again. Cylindrical forms, cubic coils, coils. Uh, coils yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, uh, Fessenden um, uh, sent the first uh, audio transmission uh, on Christmas Eve. In, allegedly. Uh, allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> some people, some people mm -hmm. dispute this, mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, uh, one history claims that uh, the first audio broadcast was on Christmas Eve, uh, 1906, uh, and this is this is what it sounded like. Good evening. This is Professor Reginald A. Fessenden speaking to you from Brad Rock, Massachusetts, at the tower of the National Electric Signaling. Okay. Mm, so okay. Uh, I think that's just a recreation uh -huh. of, of, of the of the because I don't think it was okay. that sort of quality at all. But what was important about Fessenden, whether that that was actually you know that is the actual original recording or not, mm. is that he um, he figured out a way where you could send a voice. Mm. So he he figured out that you could. Um, Send a signal on a high frequency, high frequency signal, um, that that a, you know sound would be encoded into, and then when it got to the other side, uh, he figured out a way of of, of picking that sound up or decoding it, mm -hmm. isolating mm -hmm. it back out of the out of okay. the thing. Like okay. it sort of piggybacks on the on the wave. Yeah. Actually, the sound does. Okay. So extraordinary. Mm. So. By the 1920s, uh, audio broadcasts had become commercial, had been commercialised, mm -hmm. and uh, by the end of the 1920s, every every household, every household in America at least, um, uh, and a, lo a lot of European households had had their own radio. Uh huh. And then radio. there was the whole the whole culture around tube radios and the mm. the romanticism of them. Such beautiful beautiful objects. Mm, yeah, and you know, with, with a, 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 a piece of furniture in the house like any other. Uh, yeah, and of course, they popularized, popularized uh, music. I mean, mm. music became suddenly accessible to into everybody's home, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, thirty years later, uh, they already had the transistor radio, which is kind of the first micro uh -huh. technology. It wasn't so it? you could just carry it. Mm. Mm. Mm -mm. So uh, things advanced very, very quickly, and and uh, and mean and while uh, this sort of democratization was taking place. Uh, there was also an enormous engineering project uh, that was putting uh, radio equipment on uh, on military ships uh, like like this one. Uh, this is the uh, ARC look radio. Scale. Look at the scale. This is an this ARC stuff. radio yeah. for the US Navy. Mm -hmm. So this is, must be a massive generator in order mm -hmm. to create this 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 electrical arc but of so high voltage. It's an ARC radio, yeah. 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 So so the so this is this is the kind of technology and of course we're still uh, looking at radio technology, um, this is this would be radio astronomy. Uh, mm. That's it. That's it. That is monumental in scale. Uh, nothing more monumental than what's just been built in China, uh, the radio telescope oh, wow. uh, Guizhou. Mm. So uh, I mean, look at it. It's, it's the size of a mountain, isn't it? Mm. Um, uh, but what interests us more, and I forget, we're artists, uh, and we've explained in some of the other talks that our interest in the electromagnetic spectrum is a, is a show that we're doing called Invisible Light, where we're going to do, we're going to make 
seven installations based on the electromagnetic spectrum and based on mostly on the invisible parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, the interests that we have in radio is the kind of democratic DIY culture. So These we're going from the projects. giant scale of mm. this radio receiver mm. to the dom domestic scale of a transistor yeah, yeah, or even yeah. even a crystal radio. Mm. Even a crystal radio. So that, mm. that is a particular culture we got interested in, isn't it? Really? So yeah, crystal radios are the original do-it-yourself radio. Mm -hmm. um, they're from really, the 1920s, wasn't it? Really? Yeah, even earlier. I mean, I mean, I, I think that this is the principle on which Marconi would have been basing his original receivers on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so basically it's the simplest thing in the world. It, it involves an antenna, which is a long wire, mm -hmm. which which captures waves, mm -hmm. and and an electric current builds up in that antenna from the waves it captures from the, from you know the, the atmosphere. Then a, a coil, a coil, uh, which you can use to tune mm -hmm. a, a detector that will then take that uh, that that wave or that current and then convert that into DC current that that becomes a sound signal and some headphones, and some headphones. really simple yeah. and uh, I mean the thing is you can make one of these out of you know sort of stuff you'd find at home which is mm -hmm. what I love about it you know I mean you know and, you just and in fact you know the American government in the 1920s published a brochure which which would have been the original of all this uh, the, and okay. this shows what's yeah. called a crystal radio now why was it called a crystal well, it's radio? called a crystal radio because uh, uh, the detector was the complicated bit at the time they, mm. they used a little crystal which is a piece of shale I mm. think and this shale was start to vibrate or resonate mm -hmm. um, with, with, the, with the current and then they had this little thing called a cat's whisker which is a tiny wire and that was uh, like tipping off okay. the shale and so that would resonate okay. and that would, that acted a little bit like, um, it was like a valve so right. that converted the AC current into DC current okay. that you could then go into a headphone and, and you could mm. hear it became a sound signal. So this is um, the kind of thing nowadays if you, you do it with a germanium diode. That's right, that was yeah. uh, that was effectively a germanium oh, diode. Right. But they're really, really delicate, you know, so you've got this tiny little you know, mm. wire like this and so that was always going off and stuff. So mm. the, that those crystal radios kinda of went out of fashion. They weren't okay. that but uh, we were we're very fortunate. And, and, and particularly for the, for a project which we're going to tell you about in a moment, um, uh, that we're, we live uh, within about half a mile of one of the best shops for uh, for for making your own radio, which is all called Saint Quentin Radio here uh -huh. in Paris, and they sell all these um, germanium diodes and probably cat's whiskers as well. Uh, and and all, capacitors, all the yeah, capacitors. Yeah. I mean, I always found that really difficult that concept mm. too, especially because they used to call them condensers. Oh yeah. But what what it is when you think about it, it's it's it it is what holds. It's got a capacity. It's what mm. holds. It's got the capacity to hold current. And that's okay. why it's called a capacitor. And so you need one of those as well. Uh, you know, to get a slightly more powerful radio, so we can buy those as well. These are, are electric, electronic parts that you yeah. buy in a, yeah. a radio shop or yeah. something like that. You know, but you can make them yourself. That's mm. the lovely thing. Yeah, which is mm. what we're hoping to do. Mm. And our project uh, uh, that then uh, this cult, this is a culture that's going on to this day, and you have people um, who are making. Uh, Crystal radios using credit cards and crystal radios using. Uh, I've seen uh, them in pencil cases. Mm. I've seen them in matchboxes. In, in like pizza boxes. Pizza. Uh, I've seen yeah. an incredible one, which yeah. is a pizza box and a yeah. wire essentially yeah. and, yeah. An, and a headphone. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. And so what he does in the pizza box is he uses the box itself as the antenna. So mm -hmm. he, he wraps his wire around it, mm -hmm. and he also uses it as the coil. Okay. And and that just you know picks up the sound, and and then he's got an earphone. It's like. Yeah. Incredible. And, and um, so what we want to, we want to get into this sort of uh, connection of technology and, uh, and everyday life. And uh, then the beauty uh, of it, because these things are really beautiful as well. I mean, you know, a coil, if a coil is, is a, a wound uh, piece of wire, then it can be a lot of different shapes, mm. you know, so that brings in all these incredible sculptural ideas. So this umbrella we see, the umbrella crystal radio is fascinating because it's so clever. What he's doing there is he's using uh, the actual shape of the umbrella as, as his antenna. So he's got a lot of wires going around there. You can see them wrapped around. Mm -hmm. Then he's using the metal uh, stalk uh, as, as uh, the capacitor, so mm. he's also got wire wrapped oh, around there, and Very that's good. creating and a can, current. He can slide up and down, and he can uh, slide that up and yeah. down. He's probably yeah. isolating yeah. in some way, yeah. And so, so that's creating a current that is resonating and 
uh, you know, resonating the um, signal from mm. from his antenna, and then he's got that attached to an earphone. So like the so, radio so this is the umbrella. I love this it. One, this one, but the man in skis that would be much older. That's an older uh, one. Yeah. This one. Yeah. This is a man wearing a wearing a what looks like a safari yeah. hat. And uh, so, so the guy in skis there, what he's yeah. doing is he because I mean one of the principles is that you need to have an earth. Now, if you don't have an earth, you've got to have a, what they call a dipole mm. antenna, which is a much longer antenna. Okay. And so that's why they get into having antennas that are wrapped around stuff, you know. Yeah. And so this so, is a dipole. Yeah, because if he's skiing, yeah. he obviously can't be earthed at the same time. Yeah. So he ha has his dipole maybe, antenna. Maybe with the ski balls. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. But then they'd be breaking the signal every time he lift it up. Yeah. And this hat as well. I love it. Yeah. He's got it built in. Yeah. I wonder where he's got it. So that's his, some uh, sort of a safari mm. hat. Must have uh, then some, yeah. some, yeah. So where's he got his? Earth, I wonder. Works, yeah. But what's really interesting yeah. for, for us about this is this this idea that um that the radio can be an extension of your senses in mm. the same way as you know we've got vision and we've got hearing mm. and we've got touch uh, you know picking up this other uh, type of elect electromagnetic radiation that's all around you yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. And something it's that you wear an extension I mean, of your I mean, body with some of these uh, these images you see how connected the whole technology can be made with your mm. body, you know, it can become part of your everyday clothes, it can become a, a hat or, a, or an umbrella or, or, a, or something that, mm. you, uh, that you wear on your back. Uh, it can become a credit card, it can, be a, it can be, and it can use kind of everyday DIY materials. And all of that, of course, reminds us of the very first image we saw, uh, mm. uh, which was Marconi's first radio transmitter from uh -huh. 1894. Absolutely, with this piece of yeah. metal, which looked yeah. like a piece of tin foil, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And, mm. you know, also uh, extraordinarily uh, beautiful, beautiful and simple. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a nice thing I like as well, that the, it relates a little bit to Art Pavora uh, art, you know, where it's put together with bits and pieces and there's wires here and it's like an art that's made of poor stuff, mm -hmm. but it's really beautiful. Yeah. So this is our project, is really to build mm. um, uh, crystal radio probably hats. Uh, Possibly we may, we hats. Try, try different, Some different ways. wearable extensions yeah. of your body yeah, that are yeah. radios. Yeah, yeah. So that kind of wraps up what our talk about radio and we wanted to finish, because this is the last talk, we wanted to kind of briefly recap where we've been because we've, mm -hmm. we, this is seven talks, there's been an enormous uh, voyage through. Well, I think we've the, covered all the light in the universe. Mm, yeah. If you remember the very first talk, uh, we talked about some of the famous experiments that were done uh, young slits uh, and Fresnel's rings. Which led to quantum physics, actually. Mm -hmm. Einstein's uh, relative universe and quantum physics, and the whole idea of the, the whole notion that the photon, uh, a particle that has no mass when it's at rest, uh, but of course it's never at rest. Uh -huh. And yeah. then Wheeler's participatory universe, which is an absolutely mind blowing mm -hmm. idea that a the very universe. Contro very controversial idea, really. Uh, the universe just exists through our own observation of it, mm. which, which actually all stems from the study of, of, of light. Mm -hmm. All of these things come out of the study of light. Uh, we, looked at, um, we looked at a lot of the stories of the, of the researchers uh, who, who worked for 400 years on, uh, on de developing uh, the theory of light uh, and discovering different, uh, different things along the way. Uh, we looked at the extraordinary effervescence of 19th century uh, mm. scientific culture, uh, particularly. Um, uh, that gave look, us x-rays and gamma rays. We looked at all those incredible medical advances that we've made, mm. in, including PET scans and, and x-rays and all these different ways of looking inside the mm. body using mm -hmm. invisible light. We've looked at some extraordinary creatures, haven't we, like the mantis shrimp, which seems to live uh, for colour. Uh, it, it sees ultraviolet, it mm. probably sees infrared as well, it sees lots of colours that we don't see. Mm. And it also produces uh, a lot mm. of colour, uh, uh, which presumably is connected. Um, we've looked at some of the research that we've been involved in ourselves uh, to, do with, uh, to do with vision. Through some uh, of the great scientists that we've worked with and mm. had, had the incredible good fortune to work with. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've looked at some kind of everyday things that we see every day, like pouring milk into a cup of tea, how that looks in invisible light, how that mm. looks, for example, in infrared. Um, and we've looked at uh, the oldest light in the universe. That's the, right. Uh, bright back to the cosmic microwave background. Mm, this is the, from the very beginning of the universe. Mm. And we've looked today at some heroic engineering projects uh, associated with radio waves and radio communication. Uh -huh. uh, mm. So we've looked at the story of all the light in the mm. universe, but what was missing? 
what was missing for both of us was women. Mm. Uh, it was it, it, it was such an extraordinary voyage through four hundred years of research and of uh, discovery and of invention, but not a single one. We mentioned uh, one woman once, mm. uh, Marie, Marie Curie. Curie. Yeah, uh-huh. who was an extraordinary woman. Uh, she wasn't yeah. part of that direct story, mm. uh, but she's got her own story. Mm. Uh, she's the only woman to have. Um, I won two Nobel Prizes, one in each, in two different disciplines, in fact, in chemistry physics and, and physics. in chemistry, yeah. that's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. An extraordinary career, but, but she was the exception. She was the exception. And she faced an incredible struggle mm. to become a scientist, mm-hmm. so she, she was a brilliant student. She's from Warsaw, um, and at the time, it was um, the late 19th century, uh, women were not allowed to go to university at all. Mm. Um, not only that, but um, uh, there was a lot of restrictions in what you could study. Uh, um, people generally couldn't study science subjects, they couldn't study Polish language. Mm. Um, and so uh, people had set up um, a clandestine university. The, the Flying the University. The Flying University. Yeah. Um, so uh, she, she and her sister both ha- had the opportunity to go to the Flying University, mm. which is fantastic because the world would not have had Marie Curie without that. And she and her sister formed a kind of a pact, didn't they? That's them? right. They were mm. very supportive of each other. Mm. Um, her sister's name is Bronislawa, and Bronislawa wanted to be a doctor, mm-hmm. and um, Marie Curie wanted to be a scientist. And so uh, Marie was a bit younger, and so they agreed that she would, uh, while well, Bronislawa was in, in medical school, Marie would give tutoring lessons to support her. And then when Bronislawa became a doctor, she would then support Marie through her studies. Mm. And they did it that way. And both girls had incredible careers mm. and were very supportive of each other and worked together right through. And they both moved to France. They, they both moved yeah. to France, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Mm. And the, 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 so it's an extraordinary story, but unfortunately there's not enough uh, of those extraordinary stories. Uh, uh, men, uh, presumably, right through history, um, women have just not been able to overcome the obstacles. All these brilliant, brilliant minds wasted. Mm. You know, it's a tragedy. Because they just didn't have the opportunity to have a scientific education. Yeah. So I think it's a nice place to finish with Marie Curie because she's, she deserves the homage of, of this, dedicating this uh, series to her. Bye. Thank you very much.